What's going on you guys? Welcome back to Simplify It, where we're breaking down the ACS piece by piece. I'm just gonna stop saying every day because I'm in the process of moving and so I'm trying to get multiple up a week, but it has not been daily lately. Anyway, I'm Garrett, a flight instructor, and today we're covering flying with an operative equipment. Here's our code for today, and guys, the one regulation that you're going to need that covers all of flying with inoperative equipment, basically, is 91-213. Once again, we're working out of the far aim. Soon we're going to be doing task C, which is much less of the far aim and much more conceptual information. But for today, we're still in the regulations. And the thing about the regulations is that they're written by lawyers. And that means that they're trying to cover their bases in basically every way possible with the way that they word things. What that means for us is things that could be explained very simply are written in paragraphs of horrific jargon that are sometimes pretty hard to understand. Now, 91 to 13 itself isn't necessarily so bad, but I've taken the time to break it down much more simply so that you can remember what it's saying. So in the far aim, regulations are broken down by letters, numbers, and Roman numerals. And so I've just taken those and highlighted what each of those are actually saying and taken out all the extra stuff. I've also trimmed out a lot of the stuff that isn't gonna be applying to you if you're getting your private pilot license, and you'll see what I'm talking about with that. So starting off, we've got Alpha, and that states that we can't fly with inoperative equipment unless, and then we get to the next part, the number one, which is unless you have an MEL, or a minimum equipment list. And this is where I'm trimming some information because as a student pilot, your aircraft that you're flying is not gonna have a minimum equipment list. This is usually gonna be the case for big operations like airliners and cargo operations, but flight schools with little single engine airplanes do not have their own minimum equipment list, usually. And so 91.213 kind of dives into some further requirements for minimum equipment list. We're not going to talk about that, but if you're curious, go check out 91.213. Alright, and next we're actually moving up here. The whiteboard kind of goes in a weird order, but we're skipping B and C. Again, these are things that don't really apply to us when we're getting our private pilot license. So we're going to D, which states that you can fly with an operative equipment, one, as long as the flight. II is in an airplane single engine LAN and two the equipment is not I required by our type certificate data sheet so the type certificate data sheet can be thought of as kind of a birth certificate for a plane it has a lot of important information like the dimensions the limitations different parts that are required and so if you have a piece of equipment that is required by your type certificate data sheet then you cannot fly without it. If it's not required in there, then you can move on to II, which is gonna be your KOEL or your CEL, which is your kinds of equipment list or your comprehensive equipment list. Now you're probably gonna have one or the other, but both are similar things and they're gonna be found in your POH. And if you don't know what a POH is, you need to go back a couple videos, start from the beginning. But essentially, your comprehensive equipment list is going to be all the equipment installed in your plane. And the list also states whether or not that equipment is required or not. The kinds of equipment list is similar, but it's also listing what equipment is required for the type of operation you're doing. So whether it's day or night operations or, say, instrument conditions. The KOEL is going to specify what equipment you need for what kind of operation. The CEL is just listing everything and telling you whether or not it's a required piece of equipment. But if you don't find your answer in the TCDS, KOEL, or CEL, next you're going to want to think of 91205. And if you don't know about 91205, check out the last video. But 91205 is a regulation that states our required equipment for day and night VFR flight and instrument flight. If the piece of equipment missing or broken is required by 91205, then you cannot fly. And last but not least, you can fly with an op equipment if that an op equipment is not required by airworthiness directives as well. If your plane has an airworthiness directive that requires a specific piece of equipment, even if it's not in any of these lists or the regulations, you still need it to be airworthy. 
All right, let's say the piece of equipment that you're looking at is not needed by any of these things. Let's say you're flying in a Cessna 172 that has an exhaust gas temperature gauge. This is a nice piece of equipment to have, but usually not a requirement by any of these lists. So if you find that to be broken, you go through all these lists, you don't find it in there, you decide, okay, it is okay for me to fly, but you can't just hop in the plane and go fly just yet. That's where we move on to number three under D in 91 to 13 and basically you've got two options laid out for you and they're similar you can take the broken piece of equipment and you can remove it placard it and then record it in your maintenance log in accordance with 439 of course or you can deactivate the piece of equipment placard it and also record it in accordance with 439 so to remove a piece of equipment we understand what that is right we're literally taking it out of the plane but to deactivate a piece of equipment what does that mean? A lot of the time that means literally just pulling the circuit breaker and putting a little zip tie around it so that nobody can accidentally push the circuit breaker back in. In some cases it might take more work than that, but whether you remove it or deactivate it, you're gonna have to placard that piece of equipment as inoperative. And all that consists of is putting a sticker on the piece of equipment that says inop or inoperative. And this is to help other people that fly the plane or even yourself when you're really busy and you're don't have time to remember what is working and what isn't. You don't want other people or yourself using an inoperative piece of equipment not knowing that it's inoperative. So all you need is a little set of stickers. You put the sticker on the piece of equipment, you write inop or maybe it already says inop, just as long as it's clear that this piece of equipment is not working. And last, any maintenance that you're doing, anytime you're activating or deactivating anything, removing anything, you're gonna to wanna to log it in your plane's maintenance logbooks in accordance with 43.9. We're not gonna dive into that into this video, but we did a little bit in a previous video. All right, and next we're still in D of 91.2.13 and we're moving on to number four. And that is after you figured out that you don't need this specific piece of equipment and you've removed or deactivated it, placarded it, logged it, now it comes down to the PIC decision, and that's what most people just leave it at, but it's actually both in the regulation listed, the PIC slash maintenance personnel decision. So after a piece of equipment has been removed by a maintenance personnel, they're gonna say whether or not the plane is ready to return to service or not. If they say it's not ready to return to service, then it doesn't matter whether or not you want to or your decision is yes or no. The maintenance personnel said no, so it's not airworthy. But if your maintenance personnel do return it to service, then it is your PIC decision whether or not to fly with this piece of missing or broken equipment. If we're working with our example, the exhaust gas temperature gauge, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, you can definitely fly without that. It's, again, nice to have, but you definitely don't need it. But when you're the pilot in command, ultimately, it's your decision. And the last part of 91 to 13 that we're covering is E. And I've got a special flight permit down here. And that's because basically what E says is, despite what all of this says, if the piece of equipment's required by any of these things, if you apply for a special flight permit and the FAA approves your special flight permit with any missing equipment that might be required in these, then you're good to go. You can fly with that special flight permit. That's what I'm talking about! That's one of the purposes of special flight permits in general is, again, we've got everything here written by lawyers, so there's all these rules of what you can and can't do, airworthiness wise, so the FAA needs some sort of way to create a pass for special situations where it is okay for you to fly with this broken piece of equipment because we all know it's broken and you're taking these precautions and blah, blah, blah. The point is, ECHO essentially supersedes the rest of the regulation if you get a special flight permit, that's all you need. All right, I've got a good portion of the whiteboard uncovered here, so I'm also just gonna quickly show you the little in-op flow that most instructors like to do, only because because a lot of instructors like to do it, a lot of DPEs know to expect it, if you know what I mean. So here's the flow. You find out you've got a piece of equipment that is inoperative. If you do have an MEL, there's your answer. You can stop right there. Your MEL will answer whether or not you need that piece of equipment to go fly. If you don't have an MEL, then you'll move down. Do you have a TCDS? Yes, you do. Does it give you an answer of whether or not you need it? 
Okay, no, it didn't give you an answer. All right. It's getting disorganized now, but next, do you have that K-O-E-L slash C-E-L? Okay, you do. Did it give you an answer? It did. Okay, there you go. You're good. It didn't. Okay. Did you check 91205? 91205 may have an answer for you. 91205 says it is required. Okay, there's your answer. Or it's that piece of equipment not in there. All right. Last but not least, is that piece of equipment required by an airworthiness directive? It is. Okay, there's your answer. It's not. Okay, it hasn't been required by any of these things. At this point, it's up to the PIC decision. As you can see, this is not the way that I normally teach this. It's a little disorganized and, I don't know, it just doesn't look good to me. If you go through the regulation and just break it down, the actual pieces that you need, the way that we had it listed out, that's the way that I think you should remember it. But at the end of the day, guys, remember it is an open book test. So ultimately, remember 91 to 13, the regulation. Try and remember as much of this as you can, but remember the regulation. That way, if something of this slips your mind, you can reference it in your check ride. But anyways, guys, that's gonna be it for today's video. If you found it helpful, you can help me out by hitting like and subscribe or even commenting down below. We've been doing a little competition of who's doing their flight training furthest away from Arizona. Currently, it's between Wisconsin and Georgia. They're both pretty close, so it's pretty neck and neck, but is there anybody further from that? And if you're still watching, guys, I moved to a new apartment tomorrow, so the setup is gonna be looking different, and I'm excited for that. I'm gonna try and get a better looking and sounding setup, one that less reflective and have a microphone and everything. So definitely stay tuned for that, although it might take a couple days to get everything situated. But anyways, guys, I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll see you then.